Sorry about that. That's 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 Simon. So do you want to just start recording? There you go. All right. Thanks everybody for inviting us to um, to present the PWI. Uh, this is the third time in as many years, so I think we're going to do something good to do today to have this back. So uh, we'll start from Jay Parr, who did um, an overview of, of some of the big, big challenges we um, over life in along with some of the technology we need to adopt to keep everyone on screen um, in the next next few months and put them in the week that we're at where they have to go. Um, we'll take a look. As you can see in the photograph, um, that's not quite what's the electrification. But nevertheless, it, it, it is a piece of red line which is um, over 100 years old involves a lot of people of skill. Um, in this case, all around this ladder. Uh, it's contrary to popular belief. We, we still use ladders on the red line for the operation work. Operation work. That's a very useful tool in the toolbox. So, so, very quickly, we're, we're going to take a, a, a sort of recap of, of some of the things we've looked at in the past for those who perhaps didn't see the presentation and, and for the PA people on the call. And I hope that there is some So we we'll take a look at some of the previous presentations. We we'll have a quick look at the system just to remind us of what we've got on the way to slightly different systems. Uh, in day to day challenges of performance and some examples of sorry, Darren, the, I've just got a couple of comments so that the sound is not very good. Um, sorry. Is it, I don't know if it's the positioning of the microphone or it's a, it's normally behind the laptop screen, so if you jump, can you move it? Okay, if, uh, if um, so we we thanks Gary. Uh, we we we, ta we take a look. Is that okay, Simon? Um, yeah, there's also a comment that we normally see the note screen. Ah, so it sounds like um, no. we've solved the volume and voice. Um, it's just. I think on being shows sharing the laptop screen. Yeah, I think the laptop screen is being shared rather than the presentation screen. Okay. So we're not going to yeah, just a different. Of I think it's better to just share the window. Okay, so what does that look, Simon? Yeah, that's uh, a lot better. Thank so you. We've got screen audio. Yeah. Let's give it another go. Okay, thanks very much for correcting that. Okay, so we're, we're going to look at. Um, Previous presentations that we said, little system overview, data day challenges, performance, just that's just a snapshot. A lot more things happen in the presentation, give you a flavour of some of the challenges. Uh, some new equipment and the, and the ways we're proposing to work in the future. Uh, and future electrification, which isn't, we, we touch on that, but as we probably all know, there, there are some fantastic opportunities with future electrification. Um, and we'll have a little look at, look at that as, as we go through. So here we go. Um, time marches on. Uh, this is the interesting thing. You, you, we, we, got, we got through the seven tunnel in June 2020 and down to Cardiff in, in January 2020. And here we are in the middle of 2023. So this has been, um, you know, for lots of people, I know this would have been a bit of a slog um, as, as, we, as we've got through the, the region. Um, so we did look at some of this in a bit more detail in, in previous presentations, but it's just there as a reminder of it was, you know, like most electrification projects, big projects, very much the 
sort of incremental approach to, to get us from, from A, point A to, to point B. Um, and and that's what, those are the dates we, we, we got in. So, um, and as you know, we've got, we've got the established system from Paddington there down to Heathrow Junction and into, into Heathrow Airport uh, back in 97. So that system itself is, is, you know, is, is a few years old now um, and generally performing quite well. Um, so those are the dates, and we, we looked at some of the challenges in, 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 in some of those sections in, in previous presentations. And then in, in, the, in the last presentation, we looked um, quite closely at, at some of the challenges um, in, in the, some of the challenges and, and some of the opportunities in, in around the conductor the overhead conductor system by Fru, Fru and Frey. In, in the Seven Tunnel, Patchway Tunnel, Chip in Sombre, and the Newport. So we took a good look at those um, back in um, 21, a couple of years ago. Uh, lots to learn, and there's still lots to learn, and, and, and lots to do. So uh, in, in terms of where we are, um, for those who, who may not be familiar with Series 1, the Series 1 overhead line system which we have, um, as you can see, the picture on, on the right is what we call the single insulated cantilever. Uh, so the electrical footprint, as, as perhaps most of you know, is, is significant, significantly shorter or smaller than, than a more conventional system, uh, which has more insulators, more, more scaffolding tube, for want of a better word, um, and a bigger electrical footprint. Um, the smaller the footprint, the better. So if you get a bit of vegetation, it's a, it, it's a bit more tolerant to, to vegetation than um, what we've got here. Um, so that's a much more robust system. You can adjust it vertically here, uh, vertically here for the registration, and, and laterally um, just behind the, the end, behind the insulator. So that's that's what we've got on um, from Stockley Junction down to Cardiff. We've got Series One with a, with a combination of cantilevers, twin track cantilevers, and, and monobooms. And then this arrangement, um, coupled with um, sort of a head span arrangement, which we'll take a look at later on, on the, on the existing electrified railway, um, or the, well, which is Paddington to, to Heathrow. That was the, the original part. So we've got a combination of the two, and there are benefits in both systems, but um, Series 1 is, is really more optimum for, for our requirements. Um, then it's just, just a little bit of um, a description of the, of the, of the individual components. Um, again, you can see the adjustment we have here, which is use, useful for construction, um, some lateral movement there, and, and this is fine adjustment for, um, for registration. And again, um, touching on the existing railway, we have, we have a head span arrangement, which is quite simple. It's quite cost effective to put it in. Um, there are benefits to installation, um, but, but when it goes wrong, some of you may well know that head span, it can, if it fails, it affects the adjacent line, whereas Series 1, because it's mechanically uh, independently registered, MIR, it's more, it's more tolerant. So if you get a problem with Series 1 equipment, it tends to be more localised um, and less disruptive. Whereas if a, if a span wire fails, they're likely to affect the whole of the whole red line system and can in turn it takes the recovery longer. Uh, and this one is more disruptive um, and there's more likelihood of damage to, to, to rolling stock. So we've got a combination of the two. Uh, we've got a short section of sort of 0 to 12 which you may be uh, familiar with. Um, and there is a program of work in CP7 to, to reduce um, the number of head spans within the 0 to 12 footprint, um, particularly in their own station areas. But there's quite a big program of work to reduce head spans. Um, that aligns with CP7 um, policy. Uh, tensioning is different, as, as, you, as some of you may know. We, with uh, the Mark 3B equipment, we've got, we've got a more traditional balance weight anchor system, uh, which is uh, the downside of that is that the wires need to go out to anchor. Um, benefit of the Tensor X system is that they sort of anchor on the, on the mono boom above, above the track, um, which in turn gives them, it's easy to 
why it's actually easy to maintain as well. So there's, 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 there's a big benefit in the, in the modern room with the um, Tensorex system, which is basically a coil spring in a drum and, and sort of expands and, and contracts. We, we, we'll touch on um, some of the some of the um, issues we've had with tensor axes as, as we go as we go through. Um, and uh, again, as perhaps as a recap for some and, and for you know the, for the information for others, um, like on track, we do we do foot patrols and we do mechanised inspections, uh, and we have PRP trains, pattern recognition and um, ultrasonic <coughs> trains and so on and so forth. But it's it's not too dissimilar. So over at line, we we, we look at um, we do a foot patrol, which is looking at nuts and bolts and, and terminations of cables and registration and end fittings and so on, and just the, the general overall health over, overall health of the, of the asset. And then uh, we do a high level in, intrusive inspection, uh, normally every four years or eight years. Uh, which is very much a nuts and bolts. Um, it's a, it was a repair of defects, and it's a, it's a nuts and bolts inspection of, of the asset, carrying out any geometry adjustments from previous uh, inspections. And then we then we did uh, quite an intrusive, high level um, early failure inspection, which is so the next level up from from the high level intrusive B10. So we did a B11A. Um, and that was a sample check to look at primarily to look at the installation of the asset. And then we, we also do B13 wire wearing uh, measurement, uh, particularly important on the 0 to 12 with the higher pan passages. Um, and then we do, as you know, uh, NMT um, geometry height and stagger measurements um, on the mental train, which is a contact force, um, measures, measures uh, contact force. A height and stagger and contact wire wear. So that's the dynamic element. We do, we've had lots of success with thermal imaging and corona camera looking at the electrical discharge of insulators. We, we, challenge, we get challenged a little bit with pollution in the tunnels and we use the corona camera to um, understand the discharge and, and, and determine the level of intervention we need to take with, with discharge. Cab rides. We do and pantograph. We, we've got lots of pantograph video footage. Um, in the days of when we were just running back and forth the East Road, there were no pantograph cameras anywhere. So nobody had a pantograph camera. So you're very blind to the asset um, now, as, you, as most of you may well know. We have cameras on every, pretty well every, well, every train. There's a pantograph camera on every train. So if there's an incident, we can, we can pull that information. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at short circuits, uh, understanding the root cause of short circuits. We'll touch on that later on. And then we do other, other inspections, which are magnets and bonding inspections and other, other bits and pieces and, and height and stagger. So you know, quite a quite the flavour of inspections there. Um, keeps the maintenance people busy, um, but it's not too dissimilar to what, what is done in the, in the track world, but obviously on a, on a different asset. Um, so if we look at some of the challenges then, um, so day-to-day -day challenges, birds is, is, a, is a big problem for many of our line system. Um, and we get bird incursions, um, whether, whether, whether they hit pantographs, cause a trip in, or we get issues with, um, with birds um, and the bridges, over bridges are, are problematic um, due to not so much on on series one, on the series one footprint, uh, general clearances are, are quite generous. So we get very few trippings on that. 0 to 12 are built to sort of extor um, historic uh, smaller clearances. We do get lots of, um, we, get, we get quite a few trippings. So this one is in Reading Train Care Depot. It's just a pigeon sitting on top um, of the train shed door when it's closed, decide to flap its wings and but then there's a, there's a flash and a bang. Um, so that's, a, that's a quite a recent example back in, back in April. Uh, we, we've got some secondary insulation on, on, on top of the, um, on top here, just to, they do sit on it. And, so it was actually underneath. 
cause us a bit of a bit of a problem. So that, that's just an example of of many. Um, this is Toy Foot Station footbridge. Um, really problematic. This is the footbridge going over the station. Uh, this is some service. So inside there is a, there's a series of cables. And you can see that the problems we get um, with the pigeons. So this is actually this is a, this is the TWA wire, um, and, and, and there is some secondary insulation on it. So you can just about see it in there. It's a free running bridge. Uh, you can see the secondary insulation, but the birds tend to fly up underneath and then spread their wings and there is a problem. So we've got a new solution, which is to encapsulate the, the catenary. This is just an example in the depot. Um, so just to totally encapsulate that um, continuity wire, that will solve the problem, but we probably get one a month there, um, which is a bit of a challenge, but there is a plan to to, uh, to solve that problem. Um, we spoke about birds and pantograph cameras. Again, the benefit of pantograph cameras um, it's, it's not the best picture, albeit it's a little bit grainy, but nevertheless, um, that, that, that is a seagull, we believe now. That's the seagull, um, which managed to get tangled in, I don't know, did caught a causeway, crossed up a causeway, and ends up um, dangling on there on the, on the suspension of the pantograph. And as the, as the pantograph goes into the A34 bridge, and it crops down, and then it flashes over to the top of the train. Bit of a bit of a flash of bang, but but bird incursions on pantographs are relatively common. Um, but they're disruptive. That's the thing. Birds, the birds and vegetation. <coughs> excuse me. Um, birds and vegetation are quite are quite common. Uh, it's probably birds is number one. Vegetation <coughs> further down the list. Um, but yeah, they do cause us a problem, and quite often we can't find the fault. So so we do inspections for. Trippings, and we're, we're, we're good at that. We're good at doing inspections, but we're not always good at finding the cause. Um, so we're quite often we will have you know, a no fault found situation, but it's not it's not common to to, to to have a bird strike and hit a bird and never find the bird. Um, so we're, we're, in terms of performance, we're really keen to know what causes the trip, what we can do about it. If we understand where the trips occur, then sometimes we can put we can put mitigation measures in place, as I described earlier. So swans are another one. Um, so, so swans are birds, of course, but swans are, are pop problematic. Um, so this is a piece of work we're doing at um, Maidenhead Viaduct. So we're going to put a series of bird deflectors on to keep the so to identify the wires, so the swans can see the wires because they have a habit of flying in between. Um, in between the, uh, the ATF and into the continuum and, and the contact line get tangled up and drop onto the forefoot. So there was a couple of big incidents recently where we've where we've had um, issues with swans, um, and that's, that goes for the Thames Valley area as well. So it's not just that the, the, the big issue was at Maiden Head, um, but there are other places where we have canals and streams and rivers and so on. Uh, canals are, are problematic. So bird deflectors, whilst there's a lot on up and down the route uh, and, the, and the region, um, I think we need a few more. And, and um, as I said, we're trying to, the name of the game is to keep trains moving quickly and safely. Um, so we don't, if we can eliminate anything to do with birds, um, it helps us with performance. Uh, hot weather, uh, I'll, put, I'll put this one in. Um, because, as, as we spoke about earlier on, um, hot weather affects all red line just like it does with track. Um, there, there are different risks and, 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 there are, and, there are, and there are different challenges. But nevertheless, when it gets warm, um, we have very similar challenges to what, um, what, what happens with, with track. So this is um, a tensor X unit, so it's a spring tensioner. Um, but it moves with, with temperature, so as it, as it gets, gets cold, uh, it, uh, the system contracts, and as, as it, as it uh, expands, it gets warmer. Um, but this is an example of a Tensor X unit, which actually bottomed out last summer. So there was 
was one or two, but it, but it was only one or two, to be fair, um, where it actually reached its limit. So what will happen there is, is that you know, it's, hit, it's hit its maximum. Um, it, it's coiled back in to take up the expansion, but it won't go any further. So the, if the consequence of that would be that the wire would have been, if it was to, if the temperature was to rise, continue to rise, the tensor could bottom out, so the wire would just start, start to sag. Um, that defect has since been corrected. Um, and they said we had a few of those last year at the extreme temperatures, but they were, they were being a bit pushed. Uh, the tens of exudes were being pushed last year to, to their limit because of the extreme extreme temperatures. But, it, but that one was actually set um, by installation just, just slightly off where it should have been. So that if it had been um, in, in sort of more uh, of an ambient temperature for the day when it was installed, it, it wouldn't have up to that extreme. So the other one is so the adjacent tensor X's actually weren't reaching their limits. Uh, that one was because it was an anomaly with, with the installation. Um, again, with the we have a we have a conductor beam, as, as uh, some of you may be aware. So in in Patchway Tunnel, um, in Chip and Sobbury Tunnel, and Newport Tunnel and Seven Tunnel, where we have a conductor beam. Um, and we've had one or two challenges there recently with, 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 the tape, with geometry set up already. Again, I think there's a little bit of a legacy to to, to install. Um, but we've had a little bit of, uh, we've had a, uh, for want of a better word, an expansion joint. This is the expansion joint. Uh, this is the fixed end. And then this, this would slide in depending on the, on the, on the temperature. Um, that That has actually sort of, there's a binding effect, and that is sort of it's not seized as such, but it's but it's not moving as free as it should. Um, and there's a there's a bit of work to be done to correct the geometry, um, and it's quite sensitive. Uh, you only need to get it out by 10 mil, and it'll bind. It's a bit like doing this. If you, if you do that, it'll move. If you do that, it'll lock. So there's a little bit of work to be done, and, and the team are in there Friday. There's a, Block onto the seven tunnel, so there's a maintenance. So it's even in there for you to correct, do some adjustments to the geometry. So what's important with expansion joints with, with the con with conductor conductor beams is the uh, the registration in in and around the joint needs to be um, sort of zero stagger and on a, on a consistent um, height, and you sort of feather that out as you, as you go into the um, as you go away from the, the expansion joint. And then the so that the, the the stagger between um, each registration then is about 20 millimeters as it, as it tapers away. So there's a bit of work to be done there to to, to straighten that out, and, and then it'll go back as to where it as to, as to where it needs to be. And there'll be an inspection um, above. So this is obviously the and underside view. If you look inside, you can see the slide mechanism. And so there'll be an examination to see what's going on inside and an adjustment of the geometry to be back to where it needs to be. But obviously, panels tend to be pretty inert. Um, you, don't, you don't expect to see a lot of movement in tunnels, but I think the coefficient of aluminium for linear expansion is greater than it is for steel. So we tend to get, we do tend to see more movement on, on assets such as the conductor beam. Um, this was a challenge, and having worked in Old Red Line for, for the last eight years um, on, 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 the, on the maintenance support, this is this is Chip in Sodbury. This is the week or so before Christmas. Um, interest, interesting enough, well, we had the beast from the east in 2017. Didn't really have a problem with Chip in Sodbury. Um, but, but lo and behold, last, last December, this is, this is what we had, and this is the sort of thing you normally see in Scotland. Um, but this was this is on the western on the western region. Um, ch challenges to performance, um, ch challenges to, to obviously to, to, to maintain it, manage it and to knock off icicles, um, and challenges to pantographs. Um, and the team were constantly sort of in, in and out of that tunnel for about a week, trying to knock off um, the longest icicles. So at least we could run trains. I mean, there, there was there was an opportunity with. with the buying more trains to run on diesel, as, as you probably know. So running on diesel keeps things moving, um, but also there's other stock 
put on the network, which isn't which isn't in mode. So we need to keep a keep a pass for those. Um, and of course, in, from a design perspective, you know, it, it, it weight, you know, ice loaded and things um, does does have a have a bearing on the red line and quite a big bearing, as, as uh, I know you know as designers. But never but nevertheless, you wouldn't expect to see it so much in a in a tunnel. Um, but yeah, so that was the challenge. Um, and the consequence of that is is this. Um, so if you cast your mind back to to early December, and and and, and indeed in January, the first train through is well not not the first train, but several trains through. Pan goes up, off it goes, and it's and it's ripping off ice. Um, that's what it does. That's what it does. It'll put a hole in your in your pantograph. Um, unfortunately. Fortunately, we're not. Um, we don't get much frost, and it's a short and sharp duration when we get frost. But in other countries, I know it's problematic. Um, this is another pantograph carbon, as you can see. It's, it's been, you know, it's all harking and sparking, um, and that is most of the aluminium there. So that so that was that was one example. Um, there are there are others. We've had challenges, and I remember going to Bristol Parkway on a. Saturday morning, seeing you know what, 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 what looked like fireworks as trains left Parkway Station at you know, past six. Um, but that's yeah, you know, that's the consequence of that. So in in other countries uh, where it is a problem, and and the with companies like Morganite down this one, they provide us uh, a ceramic cover. So if, if for example in Poland, you know, where they do get very cold weather for long periods of time, they're in a, um, in a ceramic cover which can be purchased or supplied, I guess, supplied, put on there to prevent to prevent that. Um, and in, and inside uh, inside here, do you have uh, embedded in the carbon? You have a pipe, you have a silicon pipe in this case, um, and that silicon pipe is, is there to if it, if it breaks, uh, which is meant to do if it has an impact. If the pantograph has an impact, it it'll break the pipe, um, and then pipe. Uh, the system will lose air pressure and then the pantograph will drop. So it's there to pre prevent the pantograph running around in a degraded state. And this is what happened with this one. Very quickly, uh, this photograph taken in Paddington, but the train you know, dropped under, did a check, dropped under diesel, and off it, and off it went. Um, then we had a look at the. But I think it was the problem was just uh, did cop side of of Sweden. So that would be that. But it's quite nasty. We haven't seen many of those, but nevertheless, uh, it was a challenging time for pantographs. Pant um, pollution. We touched on pollution. is is a is a, is a challenge. It's it's a problem in in all tunnels. Um, we have we have polymeric insulators, as, as you may know, um, which are difficult to clean. Uh, porcelain is a bit like a, you know, a plate. You know, you can clean a plate. Dirty, um, and you can clean the insulator, porcelain insulator. Polymerics don't clean as well, um, particularly when they're heavily polluted. Outside, so the ones you can see on the railway, outside they they wash, they self clean because they, you know, any dust it rains and it gets washed off. So they they tend to look after themselves. But if you've got a long over bridge or you've got a tunnel, um, pollutants are a challenge. Are a challenge. There's all sorts of things in the pollutants. There's brick dust, coal dust, brick dust, you know, metallic dust, ballast dust, name it, it it's in there, a coal dust. So there's all sorts of pollutants, um, which is, which is, and, you know, on occasions we do get a flashover and that, that metal is melted off, and um, that insulated as the flashed over. So we've got a method of how we manage that. Um, which we'll come on to soon. But vegetation is, is, is a challenge. Um, the, the, these two examples are actually third party trees. Um, believe it or not, so they're, they're not, um, there's a dead tree on the top, and that's, a, that's a, actually outside the railway boundary. So, vegetation is, that does give, is, is problematic. But all the problems come from the network way asset. It, it's, better, it, it's external to the network, network way asset. Third party trees. Um, is and I, I suppose uh, for the for the region, you know, there was a mass vegetation clearance um, 
or the commencement of, of electrification. Um, and, and there were, were a few years in, as we saw in the first few slides. So there's a, there's a lot of vegetation work to do. Lots, lots, lots of be, lots has been done. Lots have been done. And there's a big program in CP7 for vegetation clearance. So that's very much, very much in hand. Um, and we clear vegetation for many reasons. And the red line is probably down, down the bottom. We have to do it for signal sighting. We have to do it for have crossings and signs and all the rest of it. So. Uh, vegetation you know, is part of the railway system, vegetation management. Um, it's a big thing to manage, and, and vegetation gets out of control. It affects lots of other assets, not just over the line from performance. Signal sighting is a big one, um, and, and the main one, I guess, um, in, in terms of risk. Whereas it, over the line is more about a performance, whereas signal sighting is a, uh, is a safety one. Uh, again, it doesn't take much for it to go wrong. Um, this is it's a bit dark, I understand that, um, but this is a bit of Budlia, uh, which was picked up on the pantograph, caught, caught on the end of the pantograph, and then the pantograph gets into a low bridge, and the twig on the end flashes over. Um, that was that was what, that was probably eighteen months or so ago. Um, most of the most of the slides in here are, are relevant to the last eighteen months, um, but that was that one's slightly older. But nevertheless, you can see um, you can see the other side of the bridge there. There's some of in there with a in the pantograph, but it didn't take much for, for it to be carried carried through. So again, day to day uh, va vandalism. We do get vandalism. We we get everything from bicycle wheel to a pair of trousers to a pair of shoes. On, thrown on top of the old red line. This is a sign. Uh, this is a metal sign, um, to my surprise. But nevertheless, this is a metal sign which was thrown off a bridge, ended up in Panwell, um, and obviously uh, tripped, up, tripped up the system. So we, we do get a little bit of vandalism, um, which is uh, a to us all. I think that was that was last last summer that one. Um, and then we we don't get much of this. We used to get some construction issues, the delays caused from construction. Um, we don't see so much of that. But we're very much in the bathtub curve. Uh, at the end of any big project, you you get you know you get lots of snags and problems and, and, and incidents. We had quite a few of those in the in the early years. That 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 is starting to settle down. We're going to more steady state. So, you know, as we touched on earlier on, it's, it's, it's things like vandalism, birds, vegetation. Those are the things which, which affect day-to-day uh, -day performance. You know, did a bit with ice, wind is another one. Um, so it's very much sort of environmental conditions give us a challenge, or the wrong environmental conditions, um, and, and the other things. So construction issues. You know, we don't get many now. We've got we've got a bit of a work bank of things to correct. Uh, from from construction, um, we don't have too many, which have given us a, give us too many problems now. So droppers was 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 one early on where, where a dropper had been put in uh, and it had been kinked. Um, we had quite a few of those, but the dropper would, over time would snap around the kink. So rather than sort of wanting to uplift you know, nicely, uh, it would sort of bend around where the kink was and snap. So droppers was 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 one. Uh, proper proper saddles or, or, or AK aeroplanes not installed. Um, that, that was that's a bit of an issue. Jumpers too tight. Um, lots of jumpers jumped to too tight, which gave us a bit of a problem in, in the hall. Earth wires too cold. Um, also over tightened earth wires. Sometimes they need to be tight to give us clearance, but in most case, cases where, where the earth wires were tight. Um, they didn't need to be tight. They should have a nice, just a nice sort of drape in them. On um, isolators, isolators again, uh, poorly set up um, from construction can give us a performance, or if they're not properly closed um, from, from an from a aspect of a manual switch. So, and a consequence of you know some of these things, uh, pretty pretty catastrophic. That's a that's a power line groove clamp which had come off. On a cross contact bar, so it took out two pantographs 
on a, on a, on a 387 on the Elizabeth line. So, but you know, fortunately, most of those things have, have you know, corrected, have been corrected, or in the book, been corrected in, um, you know, in a future campaign, and we've done some mitigation work. But I think we're over, we're over the worst with some of those sort of early early failures, which are, which are not uncommon to over over line systems. Um, other, other incidents, we, we had a, a dewirement um, back in November in the Reading station. Uh, this was to do with a helium balloon, not from the station, but a helium balloon finds its way into into the platform, into pl platform eight, and then gets stuck um, under here. And the tail of the balloon touches the live equipment and off it goes and blows off the catenary. So that was another one. Um, we had a very serious incident a few years ago in Paddington with an umbrella, which had come off the road above into the station, off Bishop Street Road into the station, panned in the panel and, uh, and off it goes. So these are the things outside of our control. Um, quite a few of these things are. Um, GWR in this case, and our network rail are very good at, at preventing people with balloons um, entering the station. So if you have a balloon, you've got to put it in a bag. Um, but helium balloons, you know, if you do get one or two blown in, um, can have um, pretty catastrophic consequences. Okay, new ways of working. Um, so we touched on earlier on ladders. We, we don't use ladders as a rule, and, that, and that's the right thing to do. But ladders can be used for, for for almost emergency work. Quicker to get a ladder up than it, than it is to get a new plan to travel a number of miles and take a line block and so on. So with a ladder, you can take a line block, um, take an isolation, get in quickly. So this is very much uh, a tool in the box, this ladder. It's a system, not a not just a ladder on its own. It's, it's got a uh, rigger feet and it's tethered to the track and tethered on the top. So quite a, quite a robust system. This is what the teams are, are, are procured just to do spot repair. If there's, if there's, a, if there's an issue with the overhead line, you can get in quickly, um, quickly and safely with a system such as this. So that's something we've, we've, we've got into. Um, as we spoke spoken on corona camera discharge, managing insulators. Um, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of insulators in tunnels which are polluted, and the tunnels are polluted, and they give us a problem. Um, not so easy to wash, to wash thousands of insulators. Uh, it's time consuming. Um, and what we found with the, with the Corona camera is actually an insulator can look dirty, but it isn't necessarily electrically dirty. Um, and we've had some good success only last week we're teasing out which of the insulators are problematic. So that means we know which ones to wash. And it also means we know which ones to, to inspect if we have a trip. So if you've got a, if you have a trip in a tunnel, it's dark, um, and you've got hundreds of insulators, how do you know where to go? Well, you don't. You have to look at each ins insulator. But if you've got a record, if you've got a record of the discharge, um, we can then use that as a guide to say, well, actually, insulator 56 is you know, when the last survey was was given a, a higher reading than the others, could be that one. Um, and we can also with the corona camera look at the um, look at the the deterioration over time. That's important. So we don't because we don't really know how quickly these things uh, deteriorate. So by having a benchmark which says I've, I've surveyed all my insulators, and then you can go back in 12 months time and say, well, actually, <coughs> this, by last time this is the profile now. And you can manage your interventions more accurately. Um, so we've got this little system. It's a, it's a system developed with, with a company called Pace. Um, looks like a window cleaner brush, which is exactly what it is. Uh, it's a brush put into a pole with a, with a cleaning solution. Um, so if we take a we take a look at this. So we've got obviously this is the training school. So this is just a demonstration. Would use these in, in, in tunnels, but this is a little pole uh, or a pump and some cleaning, some product approved clean solution to get up and 
get the insulator to, to clean. So the, the, so the name of the game is with insulator clean, and is to clean right insulators, don't clean them over. So just haven't got the resource or the access and to clean them all. We want to identify the, the, dis, the discharge profile, and then we can go in and clean ones we need to clean. Because they can look the same, in, in polluted insulators look the same, but they don't, they don't perform the same. So we can tease out which ones we need to clean with the Corona camera. Uh, very important um, is the helicopter survey. So network has a, a helicopter, as you, as you probably know. It, it does a periodic flight across across the, the region. Um, it looks at lots of things. It's very good. It's, it's got a thermal imaging camera on it, so it, it can identify any hot spots, so as you can see. Also really good for looking at switches or isolators, to be correct. So isolators um, which aren't properly closed. So if we've got one which isn't quite closed, or which isn't sort of in line with that either insulator, it, it'll pick that up. So we've got some examples where with the thermal imaging camera and, and the, um, and the, and the um, high visibility camera, you can have a good look at insulators um, and um, insulators and um, isolator position. So helicopter imaging is really good. Likewise with drones, drones have a great place. The um, benefit of a helicopter is you can do the route in a, in a few hours. Um, drones, it, it's more, drones are great for, for very much a spot check. If you want to just do a short section, drones are good, is the right tool. Helicopters are good for doing the route for the region. Um, camera on a pole, this is a good example. You know, you can put a camera on the end of insulated pole, a GoPro, that sort of imagery you get. And there's been some, some quite good trials on the red line and other disciplines using using drones. Um, so the conductor beam is, is um, it's important to, to measure the contact wire wear. So as, as you may know, we have aluminium contact wire in the seven tunnel. Um, and that we wanted to inspect that at a, at a higher frequency than the copper and copper wire. So we developed you know, this tool that's going to be called Haltech, um, this really goes to the inside. So it's just a, it's a laser encapsulated in a you know, end fitted with the same profile as the, as the conductor beam. So you can put it on the end of a pole, press a few buttons, and it'll give you um, it'll give you the wire where um, pretty accurate. So it's good for doing spot checks. So it's a little bit of a little bit of a innovation on, on the route. So that's something which has been used in the, in the second tunnel. It can be used in other tunnels as well, um, but important for us as it condition checks to, to, to monitor wire wear. And then just a couple of other things there. Um, so we, we had an issue at the start, sort of start of play, really, with, with nuts and bolts coming loose. Um, there's more nuts and bolts coming loose than we could, could manage. So we worked with a supplier to develop a, um, a, a digital torque wrench, or not so much the, uh, the torque wrench, but to adapt the torque wrench to put it on the end of a pole, which then you can go up and put, put the nuts back on. Um, this, this is obviously a loomy cart, which is, which is really useful for getting in and out of tunnels quickly. Um, one of the things which came out of the situation with the ice that you've been so brief was that it takes so long to walk through getting it out. So teams are looking to use a loomy cart to, to do some of their inspections um, in, in, in the tunnels. And then there's a bit of a show and tell there from the electrically, electrical supply industry, which is basically a spray grease on the end of a pole, which you can go up and spray your, your, um, your, your isolator blades. So, So risk-based maintenance, uh, we'll, we'll look at the time. Maybe a good time? Okay. okay. So risk-based maintenance, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this quickly. Um, 2016, so risk-based maintenance is a, is a standard, which, which, we, which is obviously followed by track and over red line. Uh, 10662 is the standard. So in 2016, we, we didn't adopt, well, we had risk-based maintenance, but it was very much a legacy system, which was 12. We 
didn't change anything because of the major work at Crossway, um, and obviously then come then comes on Series One. So when we put Series One in, we went very much with the designer uh, maintenance frequencies, and then you know, this year now we've got some defect history. We, we're in the process of actually carrying out risk-based maintenance for the entire region. So risk-based maintenance allows us to you know, to, to, to identify to do the right maintenance in the right place at the right time. So we want to, we don't want to over-inspect and we don't want to under-inspect, but the data tells us um, how, we, how we can um, adjust our maintenance frequencies, which in turn gives us an opportunity then to, to free up our maintenance teams to do maintenance work rather than inspections. It's a trade-off between, you know, you want to, make, you want to fix your asset, you want to spend all day maintain, uh, patrolling it. So risk-based maintenance, Highlights where we can do, we can tailor the frequencies to the risk. So there's there's some you know, just on that piece of work. Well, then we touch on uh, with Jay in, in pantograph. Yep. Thanks, Daryl. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, pantograph monitoring system we have um, on the region that we've developed. Um, so it's called Pantabot. Uh, it's provided by a company called Camlin Rail. Uh, like I said, pantograph monitoring system, um, and it allows a top-down look at the OLE to pantograph interface. Um, but it's different in the fact that it allows you to work with the TOX as well as Network Rail when looking at um, this interface, which isn't normally done. And it's worth noting as well that the top-down look is different from a lot of pantograph um, video footage and also monitoring systems, they tend to look up. When you're looking down, you get a better look at the interface, at the, at the carbon itself. So you can look at things like carbon wear, damaged horns, uh, chips, uh, anything in the pan well, um, and also uplift. Uh, the picture on screen is the installation we have um, at Westbourne Park, which is actually uh, a bespoke installation design. Normally, it's sort of mounted um, on the side looking um, sideways at the pantograph itself. So looking uh, right to left, these are the locations that are currently installed um, on the region. So you've got Westbourne Park um, in West London, Southcote, which is just outside of Reading, um, Didcot, and Bristol. So you can look at essentially a train traveling from one end um, of the region to the other, essentially like a full route um, of the train. There's also an installation at Heathrow as well, um, but currently that's on its own separate dashboard. Uh, but there is a plan in the next uh, few months to integrate that also onto the dashboard as well, so you can um, look at trains running in and out of Heathrow as well. Uh, sites on screen, uh, these have been commissioned and they're undergoing a period of soak testing to fine tune um, any performance issues, things like uh, the alarm and warning thresholds, which I'll take you through in a moment. Um, this is just to make sure that before we sort of decide to fully implement and roll out the system sort of regionally that we are happy with how it's performing and that it's actually giving useful information, useful warnings and alarms that can then sort of be actioned upon. And other Pantabot systems are being installed nationally um, in the Midlands, but also uh, worldwide Pantabot is used um, in Italy and in the Far East in Hong Kong, I believe. So I'm just going to give a walkthrough um, of the dashboard, essentially looking at um, one of the events taken. So this is the landing page that you'll see when you log in. So on the left-hand side here is the filtering section. So you've got wraps, which is remote acquisition point. Essentially, that's the installation location, which matches up uh, here to sort of badminton down, dick or up. And that's where you could be able to filter out and select a location, essentially. You've then got the event status here, which matches up with these colors here on the left. So green is sort of OK, no issues. Um, the yellow orange is uh, like a warning, red is an alarm. And then blue, black, and gray are sort of like unrecognized, unread, unprocessed uh, events. You also have carriage association. So that's one of the things that uh, Pantabot system does as well. It takes a picture of the carriage ID of the train so you can also um, here type in a specific carriage ID and then look at sort of like a history of a train over the past few months or something if you want to. Uh, again, train direction, um, 
pantograph uh, model as well. So you can see here you've got HSP Mark II on screen, but we also have the HSP, uh, sorry, HSX pantograph as well. Uh, this column here, CA, is essentially telling you, uh, matching up to this color here to tell you if it's taken a carriage ID and matched it to one on the system. So green is yes, it has, and then the yellow orange is sort of it's ice unsure, and then the other two are sort of like unknown or unprocessed as well. Um, and then you've got the capture time and date as well for filtering purposes as well. So this is an example clicking on the first first one of those events from the previous slide. This is what you'd be uh, greeted with. So you can see that you've got handcraft model, train speed, uh, date capture and time, carriage ID and the calculated uplift. So first thing you'd probably take note of is this picture, the pretty high resolution picture that you can zoom in and rotate using this button here. And you can also download it as well um, if you'd like to. So you can get a proper look at the pantograph, um, the wire, the pan well, um, slated here and so forth. Um, so you'd also then get these three tabs here, uh, orientation, horn, and carbon. So orientation would be looking at the orientation of the pantograph itself, looking at um, the three axes of rotation, pitch, yaw, and roll, to see if there's any issues with alignment, basically, of the pantograph itself. Then you also have the horn check, which is looking at the two horns here. Again, looking at um, pitch and roll of them to see if there's alignment issues as well. Um, but the sort of key one, you could argue, is the, the carbon. This is looking at carbon wear and chips. So it splits the pantograph carbon into sections. Essentially, that you can click on and look at the individual uh, wear on there. But with, when you're not doing that, when you're just looking at this screen here, it gives you an overview of the two strips. So it tells you how much carbon thickness is left. So here you can say this is 17.1 millimeters. And then, like I said earlier, you have warnings and alarms. So the warning here is 5 mil. And then the next one down is the alarm at uh, 5 mil after that as well. So those are the things that you can um, set up in, in the system itself and choose choose those for yourself. If you were to click on the stats page here, this is the page you would be given. Similar to before, you can filter by things like the remote acquisition point, pantograph model, and also carriage ID, and do it by date. So you could do it by, by period or by week. So sort of, say, for instance, if you were interested, particularly in, in the winter months when you know you can get things like articles like Dale mentioned earlier. You can look to see um, if you're getting any any chips, which is the one I've selected here. So this this is an overview of all of these um, warning and alarm types here. This is showing everything. You can click on them individually, and you look at sort of the distribution of them themselves. Um, so you can look at histogram, which is spread by by date um, of the type of warning or alarm. But the chipping one here. What it's showing you is you've got the month axis here, and then it's showing you a zero point, essentially the middle of the carbon, and then it's showing you where in relation to that you're getting um, chips on the carbon. So then you can also, um, from sort of like a network rail point of view, that could give you an indication as to if there's an issue with um, the infrastructure itself that's causing uh, sort of carbon to have lots of chips. So you know, if you're, since you're getting a lot of chips, all the time on one part of the carbon, you can um, investigate that. So then just to look at some of the defects that uh, have been identified by Pantabot. So far uh, on the left, we have some horn damage that was taken by the Heathrow installation here. You can see this is what it should look like. And you've sort of got a big kink here, um, for sure. Suggest that the pantographs hit something like a bird for instance, it's really knocked it out. And then on the right, this is a chipping example. So here, you can see the sort of changing color here um, is a chip. And the system produces an arrow here when you're looking at um, the strip scan sort of itself. And then you can click on that and sort of zoom in and have a, have a look at that basically. And it would show a different sort of uh, wear profile as well for that. Another one is a rotated horn. Um, so as before, you can see the horn sort of rotated that way. Um, but this is what it should look like. So again, it's 
suggesting that something sort of hit that horn quite hard and sort of knocked it out and sort of sheared the bolt potentially as well. And this one was uh, recent, I believe this was last month. Um, this is the sort of result of a bird strike here. You can um, clearly see the feathers. And although this one wasn't actually alarmed by Pantavot because it's not set up to do that at the moment, this was still found by a member of staff just having a review of some some recent events. So, you know, it's able to look, it's able to give um, results that sort of, we haven't even sort of asked it to, which is a benefit as well. So I'll hand back over to Daryl. Okay, thanks very much. Um, just one more slide, so thanks for your patience, really. Um, so it's really positive, really. Um, so jumping back to you know, Great Western electrification is in, and there's other schemes which are in uh, or going in. Um, and I think the, the, the country and the OLE engineers are being very much on a journey because what, what that big push in electrification has done has made people challenge standards and, and challenge the way we do things. And you know, everything worked in the 1960s, and it was all thrown in. You know, so legacy or red line was put in, and, and because the standard says this is what you've got to do. This is the clearance. And this is the span length. And for a long time, <laughs> we, you know, we've we followed the standard. But, but I think uh, because of cost pressure. Um, and, and, and some clever people um, doing some work. There's lots of good stuff just being done. Uh, you know, focus PCC, focus control clearances. So, so Cardiff intersection bridge was was put in with a with a uh, with a reduced electrical clearance, uh, <coughs> as, as you may know, um, with some insulating paint surge arresters. And a lot of work was done by by many consultancies, I'm sure, universities. To, and, and, Network Rail Technical Authority and the, the Wales and Western Region to determine what clearances you can get away with, um, and, and that was all sort of signed off with lots of testing. Um, so by managing your clearances, you can, you know, so in, at some locations, not there's no need to reconstruct a bridge. So massive, massive benefit to future electrification. L longer span length, uh, I think 65 metres is, is, a, is a maximum length in Series One. Um, you know that that's been span length has been challenged, and on the master series, you know you can get up to 90 meters. Um, and told them good authority that if you can run the 90 meter span length, that'll give you a five to 10 percent reduction in project construction. So you know, that's a massive hit. And like likewise with above, um, lots of work going on with the technical authority and in and around the regions with. Optimised earth in single approach to isolation that would reduce some construction costs and particularly operational costs in in, you know, in, in uh, isolation and earthing. Um, and as, as you probably all know, know, lots of work with, in terms of wind loading, foundation depth, pile depth, and so on. So I think the asset, you know, I'm a bit of a, I'm just on the side looking in with, 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 with a lot of this stuff. Um, but lots of good work gone on, uh, and is going on, and, and lots of good work, you know, being adopted by by some of the projects. Um, and likewise with parapets, parapets, raising parapets to prevent people leaving over the edge. Um, there's a new standard, new network rail standard for that, uh, 27717. Follow the risk assessment, and, and then there will be some locations where there is no need, based on the outcome of the risk assessment, there will be no need to raise parapet height uh, at every bridge. So when you add all these up, um, and I know there's lots and lots more work going on in the background, you know, I think, I think the future for uh, electrification is, is, is pretty good in terms of how, how, what it could cost in the future. And I'm sure when the government, you know, with, with global warming and climate change and the carbon challenge, when the gold button to, to put more electrification in, because the gold button will be pressed at some point and it'll be a mad rush to put it in, um, because that's the way we do things in this country. We're not. We don't tend to be too consistent in how we do it. When the day comes to put more in, and it'll, it'll come, I'm sure, um, you know, a lot, lots more of this stuff will, will go in. It'll be fantastic to see it, and there's, and there's pockets of this going in 
up and down the land, but I'm sure uh, an electrification system as we see it, um, as, as we see in the future, will look very different to the first slide. If we cast our minds back to the first slide with hundreds of people and down ladders, uh, you know, it, it, the whole thing will be slick from design into construction you know, and into operation and maintenance. So I, I think the future is pretty pretty good for electrification. It's my personal view. You know, others may, may think differently, but I think my, my view is that it's <coughs> very, very positive. So that's that's where we are. Uh, so we're back in Paddington on a on a sunny day. Um, and as you can see, Paddington was you know was um, was refitted, the new roof, um, and the, the old diesel train's gone, so we've got a nice clean roof and a nice clean steel work. So Paddington looks better for electrification. So any questions? Please. Yeah, thank so you. Looking in the room. Yeah. Um, a series one performed as you were told it would, or has it been better or worse? Uh, I think it's performed very well. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the, the acid and the resilience of the acid, very good. You know, it's a, it's a strong, robust acid. Um, there's a few challenges with the construction. You know, which are, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking but, of but afterwards, yes. Yeah, yeah very much so. Building on that question, Pepper Grill used to uh, I don't have the data to. Uh, all I can say from a, from a local perspective, it's, it's performing, it's performing well. How it, how it stacks up with others, I'm sure we can find that information out. Uh, uh, Master series is the system of choice, I believe. There is, um, and then there's some work, I believe, going on with the technical authority, and there is also a, 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 one or two companies have developed some remote sensing technologies, which, which we hope to take a look at, actually. So we will have a look at those in Rain Tech next week. Or Rain Live, sorry, Rain Live. And then secondly to that, is there a really system Well, I think that goes in the mix on the last slide. Yes, and that very much track would be the same, wouldn't it? But, uh, but so it's track a little bit different because we do get higher temperatures in the other countries. I suppose we just have to stress it more. Track just weighs up the SFT. Um, for all red line, yes, it's good. Good, good, good point. Simon? Yeah, sorry, we've got a question online from Greg uh, Chapman regarding tunnel water regress. So, Greg, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, apologies, I've got a few comments in the question in the chat. So, <laughs> uh, what's being done to prevent water ingress to tunnels, uh, to prevent corrosion of equipment and those ice stalactites that you showed a picture of? Um, well, good, good question. And um, that's probably one for the tunnel team. I don't have a direct answer for that. But what we do do, um, where we where we have sort of consistent water coming through. The tunnels we do have manifolds which are put in place so the manifold will go on uh, and it'll, it'll, you know, it'll be ducted around the sort of the, 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 the side wall of the tunnel uh, in, into the drainage system so we, we, we in terms of overhead line if we see if we see water getting you know, being problematic and it's a constant drip or or stream we will do things locally um, but that, that forward and that, that those challenges are fed back to the to the structures teams. I mean, you, you can grow tunnels. Um, there are things you, you can do for, for localized areas, I'm sure. Uh, but in, t but in, terms of, in, in terms of what we do for overhead line, it, it is very much trying to get the water away from certain, certain assets. So it's very much a, as, and, as and when required. As, and, and you'd, you'd see that if you went into the, you went into the seven tunnels, with the empty manifolds um, put, put in to capture, capture water. But ch manifolds can bring their own challenges. Um, if they're not properly maintained, so we try not to use manifolds, but uh, we, do, we do use them on occasions. Uh, Greg, would you like to ask your 
other co uh, question. I think it's probably about pan monitoring. Yeah, so um, what frequencies of devices would be recommended for remote pan monitoring of a route or what dictates their location? So can you, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. Oh, yeah. What frequency of devices would be recommended for pan re remote pan monitoring of a route or what would dictate the location of these devices? So the frequency of, of pantograph monitoring um, well, we we measured that those uh, the pantographs are measured every time they pass the, the monitoring station. Um, so so that's so we can then monitor the deterioration of the carbon over time. Uh, in in terms of uh, location of pantograph monitoring, um, we've got them at strategic locations. Um, so we've got, the reason that we've got one at Westbourne Park is that it captures trains coming out of Crossrail. Uh, so coming in, so basically coming on to the Western region infrastructure. So that's why we've got Westbourne Park. Uh, Didcot, um, as I saw shown with, with Jay there, Didcot's sort of part way, um, so that's the sort of the halfway mark. Um, and then we've got them down at Parkway, Bristol Parkway, just to sort of understand uh, the condition of the pantographs before they go in, in and out of the tunnel. So if you've got a pantograph which comes out of out of Cardiff and into the seven tunnel and comes out. Um, in, into Bristol Park, where you can you can make a judgment whether the problem occurred on the, on the western on the on the Welsh side rather than on the western side. So, um, so we've got them dotted around for you know for for, for those reasons. Does, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, we've got time for one last question. Oh. Um, I think Stuart Burrows, you, your question is a suggestion to uh, Daryl, so I'll pass it on uh, anyway. And then uh, last one then, Adam Williams, uh, you had a question just posted just now, so would you like to ask that? Yeah, no, so before all the all the knowledge and learning of um, GWEP is lost to time, um, are there any plans for any further sm small scale installations on Wales and Western? Otherwise, I think we're going to risk um, with, as with anything, corporate memory loss. But. Well, I think there is, there is a, there's a big aspiration. Couldn't tell you the detail, but there is a big aspiration to 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 buy a Felton Bank. That is, you can get a, an electrified train, you know, from Temple Meads back into Cardiff. Um, so I think that's that, that, that's if you're going to electrify anywhere, that's where you'd want to. Do, that's where you want to go first. And, and, there, and, there, and there is some lots of work being going on in terms of cost and and the amount yeah, of work yeah. required. So in, t in terms of, you know, if, if, if somebody said, what would you do first? That would be the one you would do, and that would give um, give some operational flexibility. And, and utilising 3870 is a great thing, because you can get a 1,000 people on a, on a big 3870. You can move some serious, serious people in, in a very short space of time. And hence, hence, with 387s, you know, when you've got a big game on in Cardiff or a big, a big music event, or whatever it is, you know, it's... it's the, the, the train of choice is, is 387. Yeah, people get on and off quickly. So, yeah, Felton Bank is, 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 would be the next piece to, to electrify. Yeah, that, 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 that harks back to the original plans when I joined Network Rail, because if, if, if I recall, the, the plan was to use the old Brunel platforms once the panel had gone. That's right, yeah. That's right. So hopefully, you know, when when the, when the tide turns, which I think, I'm sure it will, over the electrification in the country, I'm sure it will. Uh, you know, that will be these these the infill projects will will come back on and hopefully more more electrification across the land. But I think I think the tools in the box. Um, you know, there was only a, a, a few there which, which I put up, but I'm sure there's many more. And I know there's some good work published in the PWI journals. Uh, you you throw that together. And, and then you, 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 you should be able to build a, a lower cost electrification system. Um, but easier, what I thought. But you, you're quite, you know, you've got a good point about the, the corporate memory loss. But what, we what we don't want to do is have another have 10 years of impasse and, and uh, you know, people have moved on. We want to do it sooner rather than later. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Darren and Jay, for, for your presentation, you know, ranging from business and business cooperation of the, uh, 
uh, head span you know, uh, to series one. Uh, some of the challenges, interesting to see that bird actually hit the uh, an issue. I would have not guessed that. I knew it was you know, a few problems, but I didn't think it was so extensive. Uh, hot weather, cold weather, as I said, you know, a lot of, uh, apart from the bird, maybe a lot of cooperative to track yeah. uh, issues. So the track engineers uh, was a very interesting uh, recent you know, presentations. And uh, and going into the, um, the, yeah, the technology that you're using as well, you know, that's quite interesting to see uh, how, how that user has brought and develop and what's in the pipeline uh, for, for the future as well. So um, uh, thank you again. And if we could please uh, uh, show Darren and their appreciation in a normal way. Okay, thank you very much. Our next meeting.